Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank uh, the Chamber of Commerce and the Economic Summit Sri Lanka for inviting me to moderate this session. And I uh, welcome the panel. Um, we have an international diplomat. Uh, we have an economist. We have a business strategist. We have a policy uh, uh, strategist. We have uh, an environmentalist. Uh, and we have a climate change advocate in the panel. Uh, I'll keep myself as the same old activist uh, steering this. And at the outset, let me say that I, I, would, I, I also was fascinated and uh, really so, uh, uh, pleasantly surprised uh, by the idea that the economic summit has placed transformation in the center of uh, the, the, this meeting the two days of deliberation. And I would suggest that the panel takes it to heart and uh, do understand that this is the transformation drive uh, and we are, we are kicking the ball into the center of it. So I'm not going to read this. These are the session guidelines and I will be prompting through uh, the, the, the panel uh, for various uh, outputs from them. Uh, and just to give a background as to, before we get into uh, the business of this session, as to where we are on the four questions. First of all, Sri Lanka just went through uh, another uh, climate uh, disaster. On one side, uh, we had uh, the rains falling hard during 12 hours and, and the floods taking away uh, some of the livelihood and, and about 500,000 people displaced. On the other part of the country was a severe drought, about 1.5 million altogether are suddenly out of place, put out of place by nature. But the process is that, you know, what happens? We break our resilience because our resilience building, our investment in resilience has not had that kind of focus. And we end up with greater di different demand of poverty and it impacts on the economy. And uh, I just, I'm not going into the details, but the discoursing of a new economic discussion in this country is pretty far behind. And I, I'm yet to hear that the new economic discussion taking place and understanding that ecosystems are calculated and the ecosystem services are calculated and understand how our economy is being driven in many other places where the 2030 agenda talks about a transformation. And we are talking about a transformation now, not talking about let's do a little bit of brown now, grow now, and then move in to another quadrant. So the numbers are there, if you want to see, and these are not my numbers, these are global numbers. And when we are moving into the billions to trillions as the 2030 discussion in it, I'm just coming from New York after two weeks as a chief negotiator for Sri Lanka at the high level political forum on sustainable development. So these numbers are extremely important. I just want to say the sustainable development goals, which I was asked to drive in this whole uh, session, has various different dimensions of uh, from the complexity, the comprehension, and coherence. Countries are jumping into putting into their own little baskets. Companies are doing the same thing. UN agencies are trying to do this. But let me drive one through. People are trying to still say that the 2030 agenda or the sustainable development goals are still environmental goals, which is not. Look at, this is a, if you look at the quadrants, this is a socio-economic discussion. I'm not going into, but I just want to say that we have mapped inside the Ministry of Sustainable Development and Wildlife the interlinkages between the 425 agencies, the 52 ministries, and so on, and the stakeholder mapping is coming. But please understand this is a multiple. I just want to give you one example. The seven targets for poverty, 128 agencies, 39 ministries has to be brought through. Climate change, five targets, 93 agencies, 28 ministries. So we are not talking of a simple matrix that the budget looks at at the end of the year, give one ministry amount of money and expect poverty and another climate. Finally, the audience poll I was asked to, I'm leaving that as well. So gentlemen, what we are trying to do in the audience, and there's one lady, it's not a good uh, gender balance, but I can see we have some at least in the audience. Now. What we would like to do is, I would like to start with my good friend, uh, Dr. Rai Kwan Chung, who was the principal climate change advisor to Ban Ki-moon at his last posting. 
but I thought when I was asked to uh, invite somebody, I thought Raikwan is the best because green growth was context by him in this world. So, Raikwan, over to you. And 10 minutes. Can you uh, refresh this timer so that I can uh, limit myself to exactly on 10, 10 minutes? <laughs> okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ray Gwon Jung. I'm from Korea. And it's my great pleasure uh, to join you today in the very important economic summit here. And uh, since I came from Korea, as you know that uh, we have uh, grown very fast and uh, many countries are talking about it. And uh, now, uh, before I come over here, I went a chance to go up to Nuara Elia and stayed one night in the uh, Hedyton's Tea Factory Hotel. And I enjoyed the, the beautiful scenery of the uh, Sri Lankan landscape. It's amazingly beautiful. And then I was thinking whether the experience I have witnessed as a Korean for the fast economic industrialization, would it be the one slide? Uh, next slide, right here. Uh, this is uh, a Sri Lankan pavilion in the Astana Future Energy Expo, which is going on now. So uh, Sri Lanka has a quite a, quite a big uh, pavilion uh, and explaining the uh, Sri Lankan policy on future energy. The reason I'm showing this is that because while you're talking about the stimulating economic growth, that what will happen to your energy supply and demand in the future? Who will be taking care of it? I know that the Sri Lanka is importing quite a lot of uh, energy. So if we have a mega projects, then who will be, where the uh, energy will be coming from? Then it will make your uh, energy deficit again uh, deeper, right? So this is uh, another challenge. P countries are, this is a view of the Asana Future Energy Expo, which I gave. This is the uh, Asana Economic Forum, where I gave a talk about uh, low carbon energy future. And I was very uh, uh, privileged to have the chance to talk to the, uh, sitting next to the president of uh, Kazakhstan, the Nazarbayev. So here are the main messages of myself, that the high carbon brown growth model is failing. This is a kind of, a, not a good message for you. I'm sorry to have to uh, explain this, uh, or the depressing message. Then why this, I, I don't have to spend too much time on this. You already know about it. But uh, I want to emphasize one point. The high carbon economy, uh, the Korea, ex for example, is a typical classical success story of high carbon uh, economic development and industrial development. But now we are not only suffering ecological issues or social issues, but also we are suffering economic issues. Maybe you will be surprised. What, what I mean by economic issues of cli cli challenges of high carbon brown growth model. The main crisis and challenge for high carbon brown growth, brown model is, this model is losing economic dynamism. It no longer can generate enough jobs and enough uh, income distribution. So this model is already losing momentum. Then where the new momentum, economic momentum can be found? This is a very serious question. Then, the second point, low carbon, greener growth is about, many, when, when I, whenever I talk about this, many people are saying, that, oh, this is only for a rich, rich uh, countries, not for developing countries. And we don't have time to spend about this. But my main point is that low carbon, greener growth is about generating higher economic growth and more jobs. It is not just to save the planet. Why is this so? Because as I said earlier, high carbon economy is losing the momentum. It does not generate enough jobs. While low carbon green economy is generating more jobs and actually stimulating more uh, vibrant economic dynamism. This is the, one of the reasons why Sri Lanka, not only Korea, but many other developing countries has to think about it. But whenever I say about this, many people especially conventional economists, coming up with the argument that, hey, uh, investing for in low carbon and green pathway costs money and time, and it is a burden on the economy. 
This is the main message. That's why, that's why people are still hesitant about this. I call them as short-termism economics. If you are using the current economic knowledge, I believe there must be economists here, economic doctors here. But uh, economic doctors are using CG model to predict that, oh, carbon emission reduction will reduce our economic growth by certain years. These are the typical exercise that conventional economists are doing. But I don't believe those numbers, and I, I argue that we should not trust them anymore. We have to think about long-termism economics, which means that current economic knowledge has no, in no way are capable of predicting 20, 30 years later. For example, if Sri Lanka introduced $100 of carbon tax, what will happen to Sri Lankan economy? Actually, no economist can tell about it because the current economy, not, I don't want to go on, spend too much time. So, now, next point. Green growth, many uh, governments are talking about saying that, oh, we don't have money and technology. So how can the Sri Lanka can do about it? My argument is that green growth is not about money and technology. Money and technology is everywhere. It's available. In the Wall Street, there are trillions of dollars there. Technologies are everywhere. There are farms eager to sell and deploy wherever they want to go. It's there, available. What is not available is that it is enabling policy framework and economic system change. If we, since we are just pushing the brown economic system and thinking about creating just some green actions, that does not work. We have to fundamentally reform formulate our economic system. Economic system means visible and invisible structures. Visible structure is like uh, buildings and our city design, transportation, all these are the visible things. And also invisible things means tax system, energy efficiency standard, all these are invisible structures. So we have to completely reframe our economic system. So green growth is not just a matter of some green actions. It's about green reform. Without a fundamental reform, I don't think it's possible. And then point number five, then who will do that? How can you do it? Clearly, it's not a job of the private sector. It's a job of the government to lead the transformation. And especially closing the time gap because these social ecological goals like climate change is a long-term goals. While the role of the business is about short-term profit. So there's a time gap, and the government has to close this time gap. Otherwise, it will be impossible to move over to our uh, next uh, transformation. So, but at the same time, in many countries, private sector, in many cases, uh, choose to resist and oppose the transformation. But I think that it might be better for the business to look into the green business opportunity. Transformation actually offers whole lot of wide-ranging of business opportunity. So it's much better than resisting and sticking to brown model, but cooperating with the government for transition to a new economic model and looking for a new green business opportunity. Then many countries are talking about, are asking me, what is the secret of success of this? Is there anybody who succeeded on this? Yes, there are some countries, not too many, but if you look at the northern European countries, these countries are the model for investing for a long term. And now they enjoy highest level of competitiveness, productivity, and as well as happiness level as well. And also in, in the developing world, I am uh, thinking about the Costa Rica as one of the potential candidates for you can think about. Then to me, one of the most important points is that long term consistency. Because as we know, in democratic political system, the change of government happens every three, four, five years. This is the critical challenge for making this kind of transition. Because the long term, but the secret of Costa Rica's success is very uh, surprisingly, in spite of a very frequent changes of government in Costa Rica, they maintain, maintain the same consistent policy of reforestation and the fossil fuel uh, tax and also improving ecotourism. Th that, policy has maintained for a long time, 20, 30 years. Now Costa Rica is enjoying. So uh, social consensus is key. And uh, lastly, I, I was uh, thinking about what can be done about uh, Sri Lanka for uh, one interesting uh, area. Many people are talking about ecotourism. 
in many parts of the world, especially in the developing world. I was thinking about healing tourism might be a good idea for Sri Lanka because Sri Lanka is rich in spiritual values as well. Not only just a natural ecosystem. So if you harmonize, balance with the natural ecosystem, rich natural ecosystem with very rich spiritual values such as Buddhism, and then combine them and making a brand like a healing tourism and offer it to the world with a very high brand and high value added uh, uh, package of uh, tourism. I think it will make sense for the future for the, uh, just like the case of Costa Rica, ecotourism is now main industry in Costa Rica. So I'm just offering one idea for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raikwan. Uh, one of the big statements that you made is that don't be fooled by the conventional economists. And I'm reading through Ralph Van Toon, is the senior country economist for Sri Lanka and the Maldives, and I assume you are a conventional economist. And the floor is yours for seven minutes. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, my name is Ralph Van Doorn. Uh, I work at the World Bank. I'm a very conventional economist, but luckily I have many colleagues in my organization who are less uh, conventional. Um, I'm from the Netherlands, a country that has suffered, uh, that's uh, largely or half of it below sea level and vulnerable to climate change. Um, but also we've made out of this uh, disadvantage quite a, um, a good case. And uh, uh, we are now specialized in things like water management. Uh, whenever there's a problem, even in Sri Lanka, I see Dutch civil engineers uh, who come and advise. So it's a, it is possible to make out of your um, a disadvantage and advantage. Um, just to start, I mean, Sri Lanka, we believe, is endowed with very valuable natural assets and endowments. And um, for example, you can think about uh, the medicinal plants, uh, uh, flood protection, and uh, nature-based tourism. But typically in Sri Lanka, these um, assets are actually um, not very well managed and they're undervalued. And because of the result of this undervaluation, um, you see that there's strains between uh, things like urbanization, uh, infrastructure development, uh, increased mobility and traffic, agricultural encroachment, and there's a, a tug of war. And because your natural assets are not uh, valued properly, there's no value put on it, um, it's losing out. So your uh, exceptional natural assets are uh, under strain. Um, uh, an example also, has, uh, uh, Mr. Chung uh, mentioned um, the, yeah, there's a, the, high, the natural disasters, in fact, have quite a big impact on, uh, on Sri Lanka. Uh, we estimate that natural disasters cost about, in the long term, annual average, about $380 million in losses, which is about half a percent of GDP, which by 2015, 50, may be about 1.2 percent of GDP. Um, and the floods and droughts that happened in 2016 are, do have an impact on, on, on the GDP growth. So we do think that you know, not managing your natural assets well has a, a short-term impact, and we don't have to wait for the long term. So how does the World Bank define green growth? Um, we, we think green growth has to be is growth that's efficient in using its resources. It's clean in that it uses, um, minimizes pollution and uh, environmental impact. It's resilient in that it accounts for uh, natural disasters and the role of environmental management and natural capital in preventing physical disasters, and it's inclusive. Now, having looked around the world in, in this study, it's a 2012 study on inclusive green development, if you're interested, um, we think green growth, in fact, is necessary, um, efficient, and affordable. So it can be done. Um, but you have to deal with the obstacles, whether they're political, uh, behavioral, or lack of financing uh, instruments. And it's important to avoid getting locked in into long-term unsustainable paths. So that's the, that's the theory. Um, why, uh, how does it apply to Sri Lanka? Now, if you look at Sri Lanka, uh, we think there are benefits to uh, adopting uh, a more thoughtful approach to uh, its policies and having a green lens on its policies. And specifically, we think that the benefits for Sri Lanka, and they are actually short-term benefits, not just medium to long-term benefits, uh, reducing the vulnerability to commodity price shocks, 
um, reduce the economic, fiscal, and social impact of natural disasters, which happen, what, twice a year by now, um, reducing fiscal transfers to the state-owned uh, utility companies. Uh, green growth will increase the quality of life. It will ensure uh, environmental sustainability and help you meet uh, several of the uh, sustainable development goals and the nationally determined contributions under the COP21. But how to get there? And uh, this is a business forum. Uh, my, I look typically, we, we look at what can the public sector do itself and in terms of incentives to the private sector to get uh, to where it wants to be. So first of all, do no harm. Uh, in the public sector, apply a green filter to whatever policies you do. Uh, look, at look at harmful subsidies, try to remove them and replace them by uh, targeted cash transfers where needed. Uh, the fertilizer subsidy is a case in point, which was abolished. Uh, you look at public investment, make sure your investment can be implemented. It's well budgeted, it accounts for long-term um, running costs, such as maintenance and operational costs, so that your investments are in fact uh, sustainable. But also try to get the private sector in. The fiscal um, accounts of the government are constrained. Um, there's a lot of savings in the private sector. How can they be mobilized? And there are uh, two ways. One is um, <coughs> uh, crowd in the private sector. For example, the multilateral development banks, including the World Bank, have started this what we call the cascade approach, where we say, um, given that concessional resources are constrained, try to, get, try to mobilize commercial financing first if it can be on commercial, uh, effective, um, cost-efficient terms. If that doesn't work, try to figure out what's the problem in the commercial financial market um, and what are the obstacles to having a more efficient market that actually can give you the financing uh, for infrastructure. If that doesn't work, how can you enhance credit through perhaps uh, guarantees or other ways to take the risk out of private investments? And if only if that doesn't work, you use concessional financing public finance. So how, it's important to get the public sector in. Um, the second, uh, so the private sector. The second way um, is how can you actually get the private sector to also adopt green policies itself? And that's a key problem in Sri Lanka, is the business climate um, uh, uh, and access to finance. Um, it's, as you probably have uh, learned, uh, two and a half weeks ago, the government launched an investment climate uh, roadmap to improve the investment climate for especially small and medium enterprises. And this is very important because they are the ones who have very difficult access to finance and they are the ones who need to invest in green technologies, perhaps to become more innovative, maybe even become market leader in what they do, so that um, the private sector can also uh, be encouraged to go into the direction. There's also a Secure Transactions Act, which has been uh, probably about to be submitted to Parliament, which will help um, uh, small medium enterprises get better access to finance on reasonable terms. Now, what kind of policies can the government look at? Um, we like to look at those three sets of policies. Um, green urban development. So developing megapolis is a good thing, but it's also an opportunity where you have to avoid locking yourself into long-term unsustainable paths. If you look at, for example, say Los Angeles, which was designed for the car, that's not where you want to go to. Uh, you want to design megapolis in a way that it's uh, has already all the public transport facilities and also provide access to the, uh, to the public, to public facilities, to uh, encourage inclusion. If you look at disaster risk management, um, how can you avoid, uh, mitigate the impact of disasters? There has to be a disaster risk uh, financing strategy, um, maybe a disaster reserve fund to make sure that the budget has a fastest person mechanism in response to natural disasters, and also link social protection to disasters, so you can immediately uh, help those who are the poorest. If you look at uh, carbon pricing, and that's a, the last big policy topic, um, we take note of a government that has approved the new long-term energy generation strategy, which seems to be moving away from coal uh, into renewables. Now, why did they do that so? Well, as far as we understand for the media, it's because they got the pricing right. They looked at ex ex negative externalities of coal, they looked at um, uh, the proper long-term pricing of coal and other energy sources, and they realize that in the long term, it's more uh, efficient to switch to renewable energy. So that's one example of how green growth can be affordable by looking at the right prices and taking into account the negative externalities. But you can go further. You can think about, okay, uh, there's, the fuel prices are fixed. Uh, there's no discouragement of energy consumption because 
fuel price administered. So if you let the market determine uh, the fuel price, so what, can, what impact would it have? It would reduce energy imports, it would reduce energy consumption, it would reduce fiscal transfers to the state-owned utilities. Um, it would also impact the poor, but for the fiscal savings you have by um, uh, letting the state-owned utilities uh, make a reasonable margin, you can actually, for the fiscal saving, you can compensate the poor households and the vulnerable households to make sure that they don't get hit by commodity price shocks. You can go one step further. You currently have petrol excise, diesel excise, but these are not aimed at uh, targeting the highest polluting gases. They are mainly revenue earners, as we know. So if you adopt a proper uh, carbon price, uh, carbon tax that really taxes the highest polluting uh, gases, um, then you can actually change people's behavior and firms' behavior in adopting uh, less polluting technologies. Um, so in conclusion, uh, from our perspective, we think uh, green growth um, has many benefits for Sri Lanka. They're necessary, efficient, and affordable, um, as long as you can overcome the political, behavioral, and financial uh, obstacles. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ralph. Rick, one, we can be uh, comfortable that for a conventional economist, mm -hmm. we are in the same uh, room. Yeah. So please uh, take your seat. And I, I was just wondering, uh, Sunil Sethi is managing director of Fonterra Brand Sri Lanka. And I'm just reading through and says he has over 29 years of fast moving consumer goods experience and brings in broad based expertise in strategy, operations, and business development. So you've been moving the goods. And uh, the whole discussion is that are we moving the ecological goods? Are we moving the brown goods for the brown economy or the green economy? The next seven minutes is over to you, Sunil. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I work for a green company, which is owned by 10,000 farmers and the name is Fonterra. I look after the Indian business and also the Indi uh, Sri Lankan business. With every passing day, our world is becoming highly connected and interdependent. As I reflect what my grandmother used to tell me, what goes around comes around. If you want good to happen to you, do good to others. This was very true for individuals like me, you. It was very true for governments. It was very true for corporates. But in the yester years, we've sometimes listened to that and most of the times ignored it. But with what's happening around us in the world, as I reflect upon what my grandmother taught me, what she told me was shared purpose for shared success. And why do I say that it is relevant? The visual on your screen talks about serious value shifts happening across the world. I know all of you want me to talk about the gentleman on the screen, right? But I have no, no ambition of becoming famous by saying something out of context, and nor am I qualified to talk about it. But I'm going to restrict myself and talk about the, conf the conflict that is existing between business and society. There is a crisis of confidence. In the yester years, the sharks at the Wall Street forced us all to look at profit and return. But I think those days are far over. Now, while we have to create corporate value, we also have to create value for the environment that we live in. It is all about having a shared purpose. And that's what my grandmother taught me. That's what the environment today is teaching us. So the question, all this is very easy in a, you know, overall general scenario to talk about, but how do we go about it? What do we do about it? And I will share a small example of how we at Fonterra 
have gone around this. We looked at what are some of the challenges that are preventing this country to move forward at a pace and at a speed at which it would like to. And we saw that these are the challenges that are facing the country. Poverty elevation, achieving food security and nutrition, and so on and so forth. We've been providing nutrition to this country for last 40 plus years. In fact, this year is our 40th birthday. Um, <clears throat> but a couple of years ago, we said, look, this purpose now needs to be converted to a shared purpose. And how did we do that? We looked at saying, what is it that we at Fonterra can really make an impact on? And we took upon us three big things. The food security and nutrition piece, the poverty alleviation, and the education. It is around these three themes we carved and refreshed our purpose. And our new purpose said, make Sri Lanka a healthier and a happier nation. We've been providing nutrition for the last 40 years. We recognize the nutrition needs of the country and our future innovations are addressing those needs, be it malnutrition, be it nutritional needs to stay and live young forever. But I think I want to focus today a little more on how are we making Sri Lanka happier. Can we do good to everybody in the 20 million population country? Probably not. But we are focused on the dairy communities and we are in our own way contributing to make them happier make their lives better. We embarked upon four broad areas. The first one was about helping them earn more livelihood, a better livelihood, helping them get better at their work. Agriculture, you know, consumes about 30% of the country's population, but delivers only 9% contribution to the GDP. We clearly see a role for us in changing that imbalance. We set up the first ever demonstration and training farm to teach the farmers on how to improve their productivity and do better at what they do. Next, we focused on quality of milk by using the latest technology and setting up milk chilling centers. Third, to promote the local dairy industry, we put in a billion rupees in growing the liquid and cultured portfolio, the liquid milk and the yogurt, so that whatever milk the local farmers produce gets consumed uh, as an alternate form of dairy nutrition. And finally, we have so far impacted about 50,000 people 50,000 farmers and their families by providing water and uh, sanitation in schools and in their localities. We could have never done this alone. And that's when I remember my grandmother again. No corporate, no individual, no government can do it all alone. We had some of the local institutions, some of the NGOs who partnered with us and you can see all their names on the screens. And we are really thankful to them because they've helped us take our shared purpose forward. What have we achieved so far? We made a small start. All nutrition standards say that Sri Lankans need two liters of milk every day we move the needle from one-fourth of a glass to half a glass. We are training the farmers, and the farmers who went through the training have had 40% productivity increase, which means better livelihood for them. Going forward, we want to move to getting two glasses of milk every day to every Sri Lankan. 
we want to expand our dairy education across the country to help farmers earn more, improve their livelihood, and give more quality milk to the country. In summary, ladies and gentlemen, creating societal value along with corporate value is a must now. It's no more a motivation, it's a hygiene factor. I think the government should be rest assured that we are not only doing it for business purpose, we won't be able to hire employees today if we don't give back to the society. We won't be able to create impact for anyone, for the generations to come. Hence, that's a must-do for every corporate. Government shall, should encourage us and inspire us. There is still a gap from the policies that we face, the regulations that we as a corporate sector face, make it an easy-to-do play, place for business, help us create a sustainable business so that we can continue to move forward on this journey of shared purpose. And remember, nobody is doing anybody a favor. Whether it is you or me, whether it is government or the corporates, we all owe it to the generations which are going to come in future. We have to give them a better place to live in. That is a shared purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. Um, I just picked up on uh, one of your objectives of creating a happier nation. Um, the Bhutanese uh, king, the father of the uh, current king, uh, proclaimed uh, many, many years ago uh, that uh, his nation is not uh, measuring its prosperity based on the GNH, G GDP, but on GNH, gross national happiness. Now, uh, we've been uh, grappling with this, and uh, uh, Menavanti invited me to uh, join the Megapolis planning project and said, I want you to assess uh, the sustainability of the plan, not the Megapolis, which is happening now, but the plan in part. Um, one of the 45 to 50 uh, indexes that I studied in developing the first composite index in the world, and I, 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 at some stage we need to discuss this, uh, I'm not very sure whether Megapolis passed uh, any of the 24 uh, on that and, and whether the Megapolis in a, in a world order where we are moving into Ecopolis, we are moving into uh, a different kind of uh, old model that has been proven not very healthy to nations. So, uh, Vidura, I would like to go to Vidura Ralapanava, who's a general manager, environmental sustainability as mass intimates. Excuse me for saying this, but uh, in Taiwan, I had a friend, a businessman, who called himself Green Robin Hood. And every time you and I sit in the same panel, um, reminds me of him, and uh, I think we have our own Green Robin Hood in Sri Lanka. Um, Vidura, there are, uh, I just want to drive to the same questions I asked uh, Sunil, in, in, in getting to this, is the business sector geared towards implementing the SDGs or I, I, saw, I, I saw a basket of, from the basket that you have selected some, but the SDGs are very interlinked and it's a systems based. It's very hard to remove one and pick uh, another. And, and, and Vidura, where do you come into this? Is the private sector uh, a partner in this process where SDG 17 is all about making the 2030 agenda for transformation happen. <clears throat> okay, so um, let me come at it from a slightly different angle. Um, I have a background in climate science. The, the question I have is what model of development can work with the current projections of both climate change impacts and environmental stresses. Um, from my understanding, the answer is that there is no model of development. If we continue the current path globally, that will get a country like Sri Lanka into any semblance of what we might call development. And I'll contextualize it by saying, uh, I mean, we started the sessions by talking about floods that happened this year and then there was floods that happened last year. Um, if you 
So here's a look at the way Sri Lankan climate works and how climate change is going to impact us. We are looking at a world where a massive natural disaster or two is going to be common every year. Okay, if that's the projection, we need to ask what does development, is development possible? Let's ask that question first. Is development possible? And the answer is quite likely no. How does that relate back to business? If this kind of a natural stressors are going to impact the ecology of the country, how resilient is our supply chains? How resilient are our employees? How resilient are our customers, both local and global? So we are getting into a quite uncharted territory now. We've had disruptions in the world before, but what we are experiencing now globally through climate change is a very, very um, high variability, um, high risk of really significant disruptive um, climate-related impacts um, coming and challenging us into the business. Now, why are SDGs important within that context? It's very straightforward. One of the things SDGs do is actually ask you to think about 2030. Um, because if you look at our corporate sector sustainability strategies, there's very few of them who's actually visualizing what the world will look like in 2030 if we extrapolate current ecological challenges, current societal challenges, and current economic challenges. Okay, so let me give you a good example. Um, we had uh, Professor Robert Watson, who was the f um, f founder chairman of IPCC, the Governmental Panel of Climate Change, visiting Sri Lanka. And he asked a very simple question. He asked, when you are designing port city, at what level of sea level rise can it withstand? And I have a secondary question. Once that is built, with sea level rise is going on, what are the coastal tourism locations in the western side of the country which will have a viable beach to sustain tourism? Okay. The reason why SDGs are important is that if you start visualizing within your organization, leave the SDGs aside. You don't need to touch them. They're complicated. Think of the world 2030 and ask, is our business resilient enough to survive in this world? And if it's not, what is it that we need to do now so that we have a viable business which rests on a viable society, which rests on a working ecology. And then we really have to come to only one, we can only come to one conclusion. If we are not aggressively addressing the developmental issues, the ecological issues, and the social issues now, we do not have a world that can sustain viable businesses in 2030. It's very, very straightforward. Um, just a, one more point, Uchita, I want to add. The, the, the question um, um, in, in this context is what is the role of private sector versus what is the role of government? Uh, uh, Mr. Sunil Sethi said, uh, said that we want government to inspire us. No, we can't. It's not going to happen. Because even businesses can't visualize the kind of challenges that's going on now. It's not a job of government, neither is it a job of business, it's a job of all of us. So if unless we get together and start visualizing what is the future of Sri Lanka within these kind of constraints and contexts, we will all lose. So that's my answer towards the partnership question, Ushita. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vidura. I'm, 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 I, I was th thinking that I'll go to uh, uh, Prashanti, but I, I'm tempted at the end of where Vidura uh, ended to go to Avanti. Uh, Avanti is the government providing a coherent political policy and institutional environment for the private sector to effectively engage in 
sustainable development agenda. Now, uh, Avanti Jayatilaka comes, starts from the policy uh, sector, from the government, moves into the private sector, uh, and, 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 and tries to balance the, uh, between environmental policy to the whole gamut of this. Um, the, can, within the next five minutes, can you answer, uh, by respond to uh, Vidura's challenge and then what we heard as well, but just bring into the interface, uh, where does the uh, government policy process and the private sector interface comes into place and uh, where is the facilitation? Thank you, Uchita. Uh, yeah, the answer is not, cannot be straightforward. Let me take you, uh, the government policy making basically uh, is sometimes, the, uh, it's not clear. So we, we have announcements, we have le le legislation, uh, we have various uh, administrative orders coming up, and uh, then we, this is supposed to be the macro policy, and we had been talking about it in this uh, forum, forum, and uh, we try to sort of understand and shape our sectoral actions uh, within this policy. But doing so, I have seen the sectoral ministries, sectoral agencies bring their mandate or their short-term agenda to the forefront. This confuses everybody. As a result, some people, some chairmen and the some uh, strongmen, muscle men, <laughs> if you can call it. Uh, uh, want to really uh, perform by showing the profits. Profits at the cost of the society, so at the pro uh, profit at the cost of the environment. And this is not anywhere in the policy, but it is within their mandate. So they are judged by the performance that these institutions are. Sometimes the, these government agencies start trying to make, uh, show profits. Everybody, right? So I, I sometimes find it difficult. Where's the difference? And uh, okay, I, you can understand the uh, certain areas where the profit has to be shown. You have to show it. Where the private sector come in, you need to trim down and you have to really uh, become less active. So in this context, the po whether, whether our policies are clear and re get reflected through the sectoral agencies, not very. So as a result of that, a lot of investors do get confused, do get uh, sent from pillar to post, and get fed up and go away. So this is, uh, yeah, and uh, sometimes right now, if you take the, right now we are pressed with a huge problem of solid waste management in the capital city. Any capital city is supposed to have a, uh, proper solid-based uh, disposal or a management system. We don't have it. From 1990 or 89, 83, I would say we had been trying to find various places to have a central landfill. It went on, started, created two huge mountains, in one in Blue Mandel, one in Mitramulla. We waited until the, the disaster stuck, and uh, where's the policy? There's nothing like that. Now, uh, uh, now we have a situation where uh, the, we really looked at uh, 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 a situation uh, at extra speed, ex my, you know, super speed. We are trying to solve this problem, and in in trying to solve this problem, agencies are trying to say no, no, no. L the land will be given. Land is not given. The, the, now the now the there is a tug of war. So this is not good. So the, the, you have to really have that policy is clear and. Uh, uh, if the things have to happen. Now, I just sort of having said and uh, said this, I just want, I don't know whether it can be seen well, uh, but uh, basically what I have put out there is the normally the challenges, this uh, any private sector agency, enterprise that is going to face, 
this really is the statutory requirement and the compliance issues. Where then we have the market competitiveness, it, which had been highlighted. Then the finance, uh, how, how well we can really uh, the, meet these finances. The, then the skills, HR, and, the, uh, and the so forth, and innovation. If you, you can lay out these, uh, uh, these requirements or the challenges that private sector will face. But you see, the, the point I'm making here is, we tend to talk about this corporate sector, the large corporate agencies. But what contributes to our economy and time to come will be on with the, uh, the SMEs. Now, SMEs and the, the corporate sector reflect and sometimes respond differently to the challenges. Uh, it's like the, the when you when you really look at how what the impacts or the the way the, the this response, the various government policies, you can't have a one uh, blanket policy, one uh, the kind of a general policy to uh, to cater to these two different two different because large corporations have. Their external forces guiding them, the meeting those demands, and possibly even appearing or kind of branding themselves as environmentally friendly, which is questionable to a large extent in how uh, environment friendly they are. Uh, and then the supply chain that is supplying it, which are, which consists mostly of the the private, the the, the small and medium, uh, we have this uh, problem of meeting and they are not being helped. That is an issue why we cannot make this green growth all the way down to the, the society and down to the people. So I'll, I'll stop there and it, uh, we can clarify and we can discuss it further. Thank you. Thank you, Avanti. Uh, brings me finally to Dr. Prashanti Gunavardhana. Uh, who has obtained her PhD in environmental economics and is currently the head of Department of Forestry and Environmental Science at Sri Jayawardenepur University. At the beginning of this year, to be precise, on the 2nd of January, His Excellency the President proclaimed that Sri Lanka has uh, entered a sustainable era. Tirasara Yuga. And, and, and what that means is that we are no longer planning for development. We are planning for sustainable development. So on one side, the country continues to discuss development plans and the budgets are defined and designed to cater to what is called the development projects, programs, and the profits that you were talking about. Now, what I'm asking Prashant is that now that we have entered a sustainable era, and I believe uh, what is said is on the 27th tomorrow, the Sustainable Development Bill uh, is being brought again for the third reading and hopefully passed in Parliament. If not, it will be soon be done. Uh, can Sri Lanka afford to continue propagating uh, a high carbon, high growth economic model in this, what we keep on calling a short term economic growth for prosperity? Can we afford that? And have we truly entered a sustainable era? And what does it mean if we have entered a sustainable era? And how does the resource economics play into this whole macroeconomics modeling of this nation? Over to you. Uh, thank you, Uchita. Uh, I mean, as I see it, uh, I mean, our present economic system to me is like, uh, I mean, failing to achieve, I mean, whatever we are saying as under the sustainable development or the SDGs. Uh, I mean, as individually also, as market, the companies, industries, all of us are failing. I mean, to me, this is basically a suiciding economy. We are destroying our own requirements. Um, let me take a few examples. I mean, uh, the, uh, from the current uh, uh, present economic system, what we can see is the uh, um, in fact, this is the economic theory. The markets fail to control pollution. 
and the companies who are controlling pollution are penalized by the market. So this is economic theory. So I don't think any company or any industry can escape from that, that, that route. So individually also we make the same mistake. For example, if you think of the solid waste you generate, each solid waste one kilogram costs the economy nearly 40 rupees. Nearly 40 rupees of cost from the health economic point of view and then the global damage cost point of view, we create that individually. And think of the companies in this country. I have done a few estimates for the uh, major companies, the manufacturing companies. Uh, for example, the cement manufacturing, uh, I mean the only uh, manufacturing, uh, uh, there's only one company. The greenhouse gases that they emit, nearly four billion. That is the one year in annual cost. So the thing is actually this is not felt by the company, but by the entire nation and the entire global. I mean, we are, it is coming back to us as the climate change, the, uh, uh, one of the speakers mentioned. And also, uh, if you think about the same company, the vehicle pollution and the energy generation, these are nearly two billion annual cost to the country. Again, which is not felt by the company. I mean, the company is showing profit because these are all external costs to the, their company. And also think about another thing we have forgotten that uh, the, uh, the pollution damage as well as we have forgotten the nature's values. So that's why we are keeping on destroying our forest. We can keep plant here and there, tree planting, I mean, it's not, a, not a, I mean, even forest department does not recommend tree planting in the roadside or whatever, because what they need is the forest, the entire forest, the ent entity replacement. So uh, a small calculation shows that one hectare of upper watershed forest in the watershed protection itself worth 50,000 rupees. <laughs> And also, uh, I did another calculation to show the, the benefit of the pollu pollination agents in this country. I mean, we as economists, as I mean, a contained environment in an artificial building in the middle of a Colombo city, we never see pollinators here, but pollinators are the ones who drive our agricultural economy. Yeah. <laughs> so the economic value can be several, near to 50 billion in a year. So out of that, nearly 40 billion goes to the coconut pollination because one of the main crops. Without these pollinators, you never get coconut crop. So these are important. And at the same time, our agriculture also, I think, uh, just like our economy, it's suiciding. It's destroying its own pollinators. And the pesticide annual cost we are importing to this country, including insecticides, weedicides, and the fungicides. It's nearly 13 billion. I did this calculation for the year 2009, so the figure should be much higher now. So 13 billion, these are the uh, official figures from the WHO and the Sri Lankan Pesticide Registrar's Office. So, I mean, the current economic system, to me, it's, it's, it's failing its duties, uh, creating many externalities to the outside world, uh, to the communities. Uh, and the neighborhood, neighborhood communities. So therefore, I think we have to think about a, a complete shifting of the entire uh, way of thinking and the, the models we thought of, like, I mean, our GDP is anyway increasing. You never get this, any of these issues reflected in our GDP. So that's why we are, I mean, uh, recommending the government to have, go for the green accounting uh, where you show the real damages so uh, in, the, in, the, in the industry accounts and the forestry accounts. So therefore, I think we'll be able to get a clear picture where we are going because we think uh, we are in a wrong path and it's not shown by our statistics. So this is uh, really unfortunate. Yeah. Thank you, Prashanti. Uh, Rekwan, you've been uh, sitting for the last hour. I've just timed, we are exactly past an hour and hearing three Sri Lankans looking at what a sustainable era means and how do we transform ourselves by 2030. We, you and I sat down in the last two uh, seats uh, going through a session uh, where we heard about the China investment model um, into Sri Lanka, the Singaporean planning model into the megapolis of Sri Lanka, um, and so and so forth. Uh, now, you have been driving 
the whole concept of green growth, you and I have had powwows at the UN many years ago on the concept of green growth. And I have had powwows with Akim Steiner on the green economy model. Uh, but, but essentially, but we are, we are pitching somewhere close. Now, while driving, Korea has been in the front, forefront of driving the green growth model with OECD and SCAP. Tell me, has Korea, what is the experience of Korea in driving green growth? And do you think Sri Lanka is anywhere closer to what you're hearing and seeing and in your research towards a, moving into a green growth, greener economy and towards prosperity and a transformation? Uh, thank you, Uchida. Uh, very difficult answer to, uh, question answer to answer. Actually, I was running through my PowerPoint so quickly, and uh, actually, I have too much to talk, actually, to explain. <laughs> uh, I, uh, what I meant that the job of uh, uh, transformation is a government, what I meant for that is, it, that does not mean that climate change is the job of the only government. My point was, the, the green growth can happen only when, only when, government can introduce visible and invisible uh, economic system structure change. Without system change, green growth cannot happen if there is, we are just maintaining the same brown economic system and we are just dreaming about greener growth. It's just a, it's a pipe dream. So we have to really sit down to the real business and overhauling our economic system. That is what I was emphasizing. And then for that job, it is actually one of the uh, jobs governments can do, of course, green accounting is one of the examples of what governments can do. But more fundamentally, the uh, government's main job is investing in, investing in human capital and the natural capital for long-term goals, while the economy and the private sector is focusing on investing for short-term return. So there is a basic fundamental time gap issue. So who will bridge this time gap? I'm saying that it is the job of the government. So go government has to institutionalize very uh, comprehensive transitional program to make green growth to happen. And also I'd like to emphasize that the meaning of green growth means green can drive economic growth, which is greener and more sustainable. That is the meaning of green growth. For example, the problems of the private sector causing all the environment externality, then uh, my point is that there's no point of us to simply accusing the private sector. Uh, I'm here not to just accusing the private sector. The point is how we can institutionalize a system, policy framework, where private sectors can perform better uh, to you know, some kind of compliance mechanism and also at the same time, government should also invest, invest for disposal, proper disposal of solid waste and agricultural waste. This is to a certain degree, it's a job of the government. It's not only the job of the private sector. Lastly, for your question about Korea, Korea started the green growth, but it just started and then stopped <laughs> because of a change of government. The, the uh, succeeding government kicked it out and the green growth can be found, no longer can be found in Korea. So this is the example I would explain to you. Long-term consistency is a very critical. Thank you. Uh, Ralph, uh, I just want to continue on the same thread. World Bank continues to advise Sri Lanka on various uh, economic modeling, positioning, on investment modeling. Are, 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 you, are you advising Sri Lanka on a green growth model, green economic model? Are you asking Sri Lanka to invest on a uh, sustainable era and uh, transform uh, uh, in 2030? Um, <clears throat> we, we advised uh, the government on, on several areas. Um, for example, um, on, on the things like biodiversity in wetlands in the Colombo. Um, we have, uh, we, we also try to um, uh, address uh, the, the competitiveness of the country, so help improve competitiveness. Um, so if you look at, 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 at the impact, uh, for example, if you look at foreign direct investment, 
uh, in which we um, are, are giving some advice, we try to instill the sense of that um, the, the investment you'd like to attract it has to be both um, appropriate uh, for the country in terms of um, having the country has the proper endowments uh, to, uh, to attract those investments, but also it has the proper impact on the country. And the impact uh, could be in terms of uh, creating uh, the right types of jobs, uh, creating jobs uh, particularly for women, uh, given the low labor participation of women. Um, so there are, we, we try to, whenever we give advice, uh, also we try to uh, instill that, uh, they, that to look further uh, than just the target, see the volume of investment, but also the quality, and attracting the quality in terms of um, what it does for your economy and for your society. Okay. Um, Vedura, I have a question from Anonymous, from the uh, audience. Don't you think we are adding lip service to renewable energy? Look at our costs. There is a diesel mafia. Can we know what are the installed capacities of the sources of energy and what is the long-term strategy of installed capacity of renewables? I think this is perfectly syncing with the discussion we are having as well. And naturally, it goes to you, Vidura. Um, I, I can't tell you the installed capacity so far, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to refrain from doing that. What we have seen in the past 10 years or so is a significant increase of um, you know, uh, fossil fuel-based generation in Sri Lankan energy mix. Unfortunately, we have also seen, even though we talk a lot about renewable energy expansion, institutional hurdles for people who actually want to uh, bring in and uh, invest in renewable energy. Um, part of the problem in, in this context is, uh, let's look at what is happening globally. If you look at most of the economies around the world, is currently planning for a 100% renewable-oriented grid. Now, that is structurally very different from a centralized generation, fossil fuel-oriented grid. We are not even having that conversation in Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka, when we decide Instead of coal, we are going to do LNG. We think we have crossed Mount Everest. So this is silly. Sri Lanka has enough and more resources to run this country. And, and in, a way, in a way, we can get to 100% renewable-based economy much faster than most other countries. What is the reason? Most part of the world, they already have a t totally paid up fossil fuel-based grid. We are developing our own grid, and currently our trajectory is let's also build a fossil fuel grid in the next 20 years, and then let's start dismantling it to put to a re renewable energy grid. This is silly. So we, we, we haven't had clear institutional pathway, although at policy level, we talk about renewable energy being grid. The only positive thing I can um, say is that in, in the current um, uh, last week, uh, Public Utilities Commission um, gave uh, direction to the CEB, and they said at uh, the next generation plan, they should build a, a scenario which is 60% renewables. Um, I think that is far too less. Um, we actually have more capacity to, more ca capability to do that. Um, and, and these are the kind of things that we are, in, you know, as a country, we are, not lack we are lacking because we really don't have the level of imagination to break free from the colonial model that's imposed on us, right? We are trying to follow Europe or US as they are now in 2030. We are trying to get there by 2030, mm -hmm. as opposed to asking, even if you want to follow them, as opposed to asking, what is the energy grid in Germany going to look like in 2030? And asking, can we get there faster? Why not? So, I mean. Thank you. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm being amused here. I'm, I'm getting some fantastic questions. And Sunil, uh, many of them are uh, 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 targeting you. Now, uh, what sustainability policies are embedded by companies beyond selective CSR 
uh, into their business operations. Is selling two glasses of milk more important than developing sustainable local supply chains and addressing polluting one-time use packaging? Hold on, one more. And it says, Sunil, if you are green, should you not be giving fresh milk to this nation and not powdered milk? This walk the talk session? Who has asked this question? Thank you very much. <laughs> um, let, me, uh, let me just start by saying that, look, it is not only social, economic, or ecological sustainability. All three are important. And it's about choices amongst the private sector companies in terms of where you think you can maximize your impact and do it in a focused manner versus doing a little, little everywhere. We do work on um, water, we do work on energy, and that I did not mention, but that's always on, along with the other work that we do. Your um, second question about why not liquid milk? Sri Lankans as a generation have grown up with milk powder. There is a total production of 330 million liters of milk in the country annually. These are government statistics, I'm not creating them. Out of which 220 million liter comes back into the market. The balance is consumed somewhere in the middle, either by the farmers themselves or somewhere lost due to supply chain inefficiencies. That 220 million liters, if you convert the entire thing into powder, you can make 28,000 tons of powder. The annual demand is almost 100,000 tons, to be precise, around 92,000 tons. So there is a 70,000 ton gap. Country is not milk self-sufficient, right? Second is a habit of growing up with milk powder. I have grown up in my country consuming liquid milk. I just cannot consume milk powder. Right? I grew up eating paranthas. My daughter takes cornflakes, but I can't. So I think it takes a couple of generations to change food habits. Are we doing enough to help in that? Absolutely. We collect a very small amount compared to a lot of our competitors. We collect about 50,000 or 45,000 liters of milk every day, which is locally produced. We convert that into flavored milk, into yogurt, and are providing alternative forms of dairy nutrition to grow that, right? So that's one part answer. Second part, yogurt cups, plastic. Fully agree with whosoever has asked that question. Very valid question. I think we as an industry need to look at that. But a solution of saying we will charge you five bucks and then you go and collect the yogurt cups from every outlet, the empty cups, it can't be more ridiculous than that. I think what we need to do as an organization, as a government, to look at sustainable packaging, to slowly move to that and get rid of that. So it's not that we are running away from that. It's just that what we get worried is that knee-jerk reactions and knee-jerk solutions suggested to something which we know is not going to work in the long term. So ecological, Social, economical, all three are important. Whatever we choose to do has an impact on the others. Liquid milk, absolutely. I will urge you all to take in liquid milk. I will save all the taxes, etc., that I pay, right? We are working on growing that milk, and I spoke to you about that. And plastic packaging work is on to get it sorted. And that has to be an industry effort. Thank you, Sunil. Now, <coughs> seriously, thank you. <laughs> because we, we end, intend to move away from powder. I don't want to get into this debate. But uh, I, want to, I mean, let's get into the macroeconomics and stuff. You know, uh, there's a question. Uh, there are many environmental plans, but there are, they are not sufficiently reflected in uh, economic plans in Sri Lanka. I'll give you uh, another background to this. Uh, a UNDP, a uh, UN, uh, led by UNDP uh, team, mapping, it's called MAPS mission, was in Sri Lanka a month ago or so. Uh, and, and their mission was to help assist uh, plan uh, 
the 2030 uh, strategies uh, implementing the SDGs. And, and, and uh, Sri Lanka did not have a national strategic plan. So they were given one document called the Public Investment Program. The Public Investment Program, if you, if, once you calculate it, has 1.1% or so uh, on uh, environmental protection and uh, uh, social protection has about the same. So not even 2.5% out of the entire investment plan. Now, how do you expect a planning process for transformation to happen there? So again, tell me, uh, please also don't uh, isolate Sri Lanka. Uh, the UN system has 500 plus multilateral environmental agreements signed by our same leaders. And it is fragmented all over the place. So what's the problem here? What is, I mean, do we need more environmental plans not reflected in the economic plans? Yes. I think, Ujita, this you are touching on something uh, fundamental uh, in, the, in the planning process. Uh, and uh, we are quite good at being driven by external forces, whether we like it or not. How did we start this uh, environmental planning? From the World Summit, uh, we are being driven by that. Even sustainable agenda, it is somewhat, there's nothing wrong in this. There's nothing wrong, but we are trying to sort of make it Sri Lankanized, right? And, uh, and failing miserably in doing so. So this is what the, where, the, where the problem starts. Uh, I think uh, when it comes to uh, plans, biodiversity action plan, environmental action plan, climate change has uh, several uh, indices, uh, and uh, now that is the latest and they keep on coming out. And none of these things are actually reflected in the economic plan. Now let us look at these sessions here. Where do we discuss about the sustainability? At the end of the session, when everybody is probably thinking of going home, sixth session or the seventh session. <laughs> Why can't this be on the first session or second session so that it can set the, the pace? so that we have the framework of sustainability within which we discuss or everything else. So d still we tend to do this sustainability issue by the way. By the way, it is necessary. And this is, uh, this is a lot of uh, companies reflected in the CSR strategy. So it is not getting into the mainstream unless it become a regulatory unless it become uh, part of the planning process, whether we like it or not, still the only the, with all the, de the faults and the f drawbacks, EIA is the only process hmm. that still allow some environmental, uh, environmental aspects to get into the project. And we have, with all the drawbacks, still uh, m managed to bring in some sense, environmental sense into the projects. But it's not sufficient. It's totally inadequate. It needs to be revived. It needs to be get, uh, get uh, up to date. And many changes need to happen in this regard. So I think uh, uh, to answer your question, we are very good in planning because there, it's coming as a package to plan and produce. But after that, we go with the business of doing uh, things as, as usual. Take the central bank report. You know, at the end of the each sec uh, sector, you have a few lines about the, the sustainability issue. At least it is there now, right? But it needs to be a lot more upfront, upstream. And, and, uh, and then the, I think private sector will fall in line and uh, uh, with this uh, change of mindset. Thank you. Thank you, Avanti. Uh, we are, we, are, we, are, we are in the last 10 to 12 minutes of this. Sorry, I, I very clearly said that we start five minutes late. We borrow five minutes from the coffee break. Uh, coffee, yeah, sorry, that's okay. That's what the agreement was, and we will stick to the extra five minutes taken away from us. Um, and uh, sorry, I mean, that is how it goes. Uh, lunch and coffee breaks are not the most important things. The dialogue, the discoursing of this is the most important thing. So five minutes we can bear extra. And uh, Vidura, 
just we need to bring drive this back to this forum. It's an economic forum. If you look at the landscape of this participation, comes probably a lot from the private sector. Now, we are in a sustainable era, whether it's a proclamation from the president or not. Because 193 leaders on earth have signed on to the 2030 agenda, because in 2012, going to Rio plus 20, we said that there was no political will to implement the agenda 21 agreed upon in 1992. Now, what is the role or how does business become a partner? What is the partnership? What are the mechanisms of a partnership in this transformation from the private sector? Mm, I think it's, it's uh, I'm going to speak about Sri Lanka because this is very contextual because the role the business sector plays um, and you know, it, it, if we know where we want to go, we need to look at it and say what is not happening. So the, the issue that I see is that the government lacks capacity to think um, coherently and holistically on this. Um, and I think, now, I would love to say this is where business has to support the government. But unfortunate situation is that I don't think the businesses are also capable of coherently and holistically thinking about it. For us, um, in, in general business sector in Sri Lanka, sustainability is a nice to have that you put in your report, it's for reporting, it makes your people feel good. It's not about critical business decision making and that's a problem. Um, we, we speak about economy and we always privilege economic sense-making over the ecological sense-making. Now, this is fundamentally wrong. The second issue that we have is, um, uh, you know, the, the ecology is collapsing. Let's, let's be very, very clear about this. Globally, the ecology is collapsing, and if it collapses, there is no economy for anybody to build businesses around. Um, I think businesses have a critical role in actually thinking about this because it's our long-term sustainability as well and bringing this conversation up into the open, right? And I think this is the role that business has to play first is to have a robust conversation about what this is. But there is something that the businesses have to do before that. We have to unlock our sustainability teams in the nice little cages that they've been put in. If the sustainability teams are not part of the critical business decision-making process in the company, we are not going to get to any kind of transformation inside the company. We are not going to get the kind of conversation inside the company that thinks long-term about these issues. And if the companies are not having this conversation, we cannot influence or drive the conversation within the state sector to build that. Thank you. Uh, we are starting to wrap up. Prashanti, from the company to the nation and the transformation towards sustainable development, what are your final messages uh, to the forum? Yeah, I mean, we are talking about the economic, ecological, and social sustainability as like uh, three things we have to achieve. But I think it's a kind of a myth that we have been uh, believing in for a, some time. And Vidura clearly mentioned, I mean, this whole earth, it has certain capacities to do certain things. So you cannot think about unlimited economic growth. I mean, the social development. So these all are within the ecology. So the, the entire ecosystem has the ultimate word. So you can't go beyond. I mean, whenever you try to go beyond, it will like reiterate back to us, I mean, in a very heavy way. So I think uh, we have to understand that the limits of the nature as the ultimate word. So if you play all your roles within that, I think we are safe. So this is uh, the final thing I have to say. Thank you. I'm trying to stay within the social contract of the extra five minutes uh, given to us. And uh, gentlemen, any final thoughts within 30 seconds, 40 seconds? I think uh, the final uh, the issue is how can we present green 
as a uh, profit opportunity for the business. Because the investing in the sustainability should be regarded as an opportunity for interest or a profit. Otherwise, there's no interest from the private sector. So uh, actually, I have been documenting the examples where the companies are investing in green and they make profit. So this is a kind of approach that we should present the, as an incentive for the private sector. A quick one from my side. I think sustainability goals appearing on the scorecard is going to make a big difference. Second, and we, uh, we are in the process of doing that, and now we are evaluated on that, and obviously when you're evaluated on something, you get more serious about it. Second thing, I think we're talking about a behavior change and a mindset change. We need to change our beliefs. We are not doing this for anybody. We are doing it for ourselves. We are doing it for generations to come so that we leave them a place to live which uh, really is livable. But otherwise, if we don't do that, it is going to be difficult. Um, it's important to get um, clear, consistent, and coherent policies on green growth um, uh, for the private sector. Make sure you get the prices right. Make sure you value externalities, and then you'll see that many of these policies are, in fact, affordable and in the interest also of the business. Yeah. I think uh, I would say that it's important for the private sector to engage the government uh, on I, 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 must actually, I must congratulate the private sector on one front. Now, in the recent past, I have seen several platforms uh, where private sector actively participate and, uh, and try to do something, whereas many government institutions have failed to do so. So uh, it's very important that uh, private sector, in fact, engages government on some of these problems, especially on behalf of the SME sector. I, 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 I think this is missing in our dialogue discussion and that groups like chambers, trade associations can play a very vital role in bringing this to the forefront and, and, and uh, getting or, or facilitating this change uh, towards the green growth. Thank you. So um, living in an ecologically aware household, the biggest problem I have is that I can't answer the questions that my daughters ask me. Um, you know, Kalpitiya coral reef, 99% of it bleached this year. Whether we stick to uh, Paris Agreement or not, there is nothing we can do to save the coral reefs around Sri Lanka and even the Great Barrier Reef. There's nothing, absolutely nothing. The question I have to ask is, before we become corporate practitioners, we become humans. And if there is no coral reefs, are we as much of a human or a less of a human? Thank you. Thank you. Finally, finally, just want to get back to the question of conventional and non-conventional economists. I met a, uh, a lady uh, in a very ca uh, living in a Kajan hut in a poor village. And uh, we normally, when we go into villages, we ask, uh, how's life? And she said that, you know, we, those days we used to earn about 30, 40 rupees a day, but we had uh, uh, gold in our ears and our necklaces around gold, around our necks, the chains. But today we earn about 200 rupees, but we hardly managed to meet the three meals. Now, what has growth done? and whether you color it green or brown. And when you, give, when you bring transformation into a center of a dialogue, do you again give lip service to transformation and try to give it connotations rather than taking it an understanding for the last 40 years of lip service to sustainable development? 1972, the Stockholm Human Environment Conference, 1992, Environment and Development, the first Earth Summit, Johannesburg, the Sustainable Development Summit, and then 2012, the Rio Plus 20 Summit, all ultimately said that we have been talking about sustainable development, but we have not had political commitment. 2030 is just about 13 years around the bush, around the corner, and we are tinkering around the same little corners of the growth model. And gentlemen, my job here was not to be a diplomat. He's the carrier diplomat. I'm just here taking refuge to set up the SDG planning process and implementing a transformation in this country. 
and that has to end very fast because I am an activist and I believe that each of us in this panel had been an activist. Thank you so much. It was a pleasant surprise and a good evening to have one and a half hours. I hope this one and a half hours will reflect into the next 13 years and the transformation becomes a reality and you are committed to it. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, kindly remain in your seats as we will be continuing with the 7th and 8th sessions of the Sri Lanka Economic Summit. We will be breaking for the networking session at 5.30. Thank you.